This is a, a fairly brief talk. I'm going to get more into the HIV and ART safety tomorrow. Um, but the objective of this is to explain the importance of investigating adverse birth com outcomes other than birth defects in our <laughs> excuse me, our teratovigilance programs. This is a graph um, in the blue of women in the United States who are on four or more medications at any time in pregnancy. And in the red line, that's women who are taking four or more medications at any time during the first trimester of pregnancy. And I included this um, to say that, you know, there's been this really rapid increase in medication use in pregnancy, or at least we've recognized that. There's just more medicines available. Um, and so this is a really new field, and I think it's important to realize that there have been some major cases like DES and thalidomide that have kind of formed this, but we're really just starting to figure out how to study teratogens, what the effects of these medications are, and it's becoming more and more of an important issue. So I think a lot of the work that has been done um, was really framed by the thalidomide disaster. Um, this has been mentioned already, but thalidomide was introduced in the late 50s, and really it was worldwide, um, at least 40 countries. And there was an off-label use um, of this medication, which was basically a sedative or, or to help sleep for nausea and pregnancy. <clears throat> and it was associated with really severe birth defects, um, limbs, as Dr. Uh, Holmes mentioned, craniofacial defects. And nobody really knows how many children were affected. There's some estimates in the tens to possibly hundreds of thousands of children, and also a really large number of miscarriages that we've really never figured out. What this disaster did was raise global awareness of the risk of birth defects as a result of medication in pregnancy. It's not a, it wasn't new, but I think this really raised the level to, you know, it was in the news, people were very aware. And in a good way, it forced regulatory changes in many different countries, in new drug development, clinical trials of drugs. Um, but it also framed the way we've looked at drug safety in pregnancy to really focus primarily on birth defects. As drug exposures are continuing to rise, we're realizing that medication in pregnancy is associated with adverse outcomes other than just birth defects. Um, birth defects increase the risk of miscarriage and stillbirth. But there's also some growing evidence that other medications are associated with preterm birth, low birth weight, small for gestational age, stillbirth. And these other adverse birth outcomes, like preterm birth, are very common. So small increases can have a very large public health impact. And this impact is particularly important in settings where we work, where there isn't necessarily the neonatal intensive care to deal with very preterm or very small babies. So I'll get into each one a little bit more specifically. I think we probably all know in this room that there's been a lot of studies that birth defects are, especially severe birth defects, um, can lead to stillbirth. So what happens if we don't include stillbirth in our teratovigilance is that we can miss an effect of a medication. Um, we can miss this effect because some studies only look at live births, um, but we also miss this effect because if the, if the defect isn't visually um, seen on the stillbirth, and we live in places where autopsy is pretty, has low uptake, at least in Botswana, maybe different in South Africa, we could completely miss internal uh, defects. So this is not to say that um, stillbirth, just looking at stillbirth rates is the answer for finding defects, but I think it's an important adjunct to looking for defects. It can be an early warning signal, even if you can't actually examine the baby. So just looking at the stillbirth rate can at least provide an early warning signal. Uh, and then I'm going to discuss a few um, medications that are associated with these other adverse birth outcomes. Um, there's a relatively limited literature out there on this. We know that Toxins, cocaine, methamphetamines can lead to, or at least associated with preterm delivery. Um, Anti-epileptic drugs, which have been well studied in pregnancy because they were known to cause birth defects, um, also have 
been shown to lead to interuterine growth restriction, small babies, and possibly preterm delivery. Um, most of my focus on this has come through the work in HIV. And we have growing evidence that protease inhibitors, a class of HIV medication, leads to specifically preterm birth. Um, and in Botswana, we have been finding that nevirapine is also associated with preterm birth, small for gestational age, and stillbirth. Then there's other medications like SSRIs, which have been linked to preterm birth, as well as uh, sedative benzodiazepines. Um, and I think what's important to note about this list is that these are drugs which treat conditions which are common in pregnant women and young, healthy, or reproductive age women, chronic diseases like epilepsy, HIV, depression. There's probably so many more effects of so many other drugs out there that we just don't study because they don't happen commonly in HIV infection, or sorry, <laughs> in uh, young women. And then there's an issue of is there biologic plausibility to these other adverse birth outcomes? I think it's, it's quite clear for birth defects. We, we understand that a medication causes a disruption in embryo embryologic development. We know a lot about embryologic development, what happens at this stage, what happens at the next stage. So it's easy to understand that a medication could play a disruptive effect and then cause a birth defect. Um, this could be, for example, we know that folate is necessary for the neural tube to, to develop correctly. So a medication which antagonizes folate might therefore reasonably lead to a neural tube defect. But really less is known about what is the mechanism or the biologic plausibility for this to cause a preterm birth. And part of that is just we really don't understand partuition. What are all the factors? It's such a complicated process. Um, but from HIV, we are understanding that there are biologic possibilities and there are mechanisms that may underlie this. So there's some really interesting research coming out of uh, Toronto using both mouse models and humans that protease inhibitors may cause preterm birth um, by direct maternal and fetal uh, effects on the adrenal axis, lowering maternal progesterone, potentially increasing fetal DHEA, and causing an imbalance in estrogen and progesterone. And then in Botswana, we've been looking at nevirapine and how that could, might cause a stillbirth or intrauterine growth restriction. And we've found that it appears that nevirapine may cause placental insufficiency, um, it looks like in our data that it's probably via maternal hypertension and, and possibly endothelial dysfunction early in placentation when you really need the maternal and the fetal vessels to come together um, well for the health of the placenta. So these are actually possible and biologically plausible mechanisms. And then lastly, um, these things like preterm birth and low birth weight are common. So small increases can have a very large public health impact. And this is a, a gross oversimplification, but I'm just trying to get at what, what I mean by this. So for the, as, as I think several people have mentioned before, birth defects in single birth defects are fairly rare. So neural tube defects occur in about one in a thousand births. And let's just say we have medication A which increase the risk of neural tube defects by 10 times. So that's a pretty big effect. So in an exposed population, you might have about 10 births in 1,000 with a neural tube defect. Or saying that a different way, you might have nine more bad outcomes per 1,000 births if, you, if everyone in the population had the drug exposure. And then you contrast that with preterm birth, which occurs in about 100 per 1,000 births, probably more than that. Um, and then you have Medication B, which increases the risk of preterm by about two. So in an exposed population, you'd have 200 preterm births in 1,000, or 100 more bad outcomes per 1,000 births in a population with drug exposure. And you kind of compare that to the nine worse outcomes, even though the effect of medication A was much, much stronger. Um, and this is not to say that preterm is worse than birth defects. I mean, we need to be looking at all of these bad birth outcomes. This is just to think about how 
this is going to play out in your, in your population. And of course, this is probably, again, things that we already know, but preterm birth is the leading cause of death for children under five uh, and directly impacts neonatal mortality. You can see in the, in the circle graph that it's about 35% or so um, of all neonatal deaths. And down there is congenital abnormalities, 270,000 per year, which is also extremely important. Um, and when you combine those two, you know, it, it, we're talking about things that are, are having major public health impact. And again, just to point out, the last two bars are Sub-Saharan Africa and Southern Asia. These are preterm birth and bad outcomes are things that are disproportionately uh, occurring in our settings with the limited resources to take care of these babies. Um, and it's not just preterm birth, uh, small for gestational age and IUGR is also an, a very important cause of morbidity and mortality. So as you decrease the birth weight per gestational age down from 10 to three to one, both morbidity and mortality just, just spike. And so being common is a problem for public health, but it's also um, a problem in sort of relying on the clinician to notice, right? So we have birth defects, which are often, especially in the examples we've used, dramatic, visible, and not common. So an astute clinician who sees this might notice, might be able to publish a case report, and that might get us going down the path of actually understanding a birth defect. But clinicians see so many preterm births, so many small babies, they're unlikely to be noticing an association with a medication. It's possible, but it's much, much harder. Um, and I think to see the links between medications and these common adverse outcomes, you really need pharmacovigilance to detect it rather than the astute clinician. And it's highly unlikely that a clinician is gonna be able to publish a case report on something like preterm just because it happened on a medication. No, nobody would take that in a journal. And then, of course, I, I just touched on preterm and small for gestational age, but there's other outcomes which are also very important and much harder and much more expensive to evaluate. Um, and I think we'll, we'll be hearing about all of these and have already heard, but miscarriage, early termination, and long-term pediatric outcomes such as neurodevelopment and growth, pediatric cancer, adult cancer, um, all of these are, are important to think about um, as we're designing these studies. So in conclusion, I, I just hope everybody can sort of start thinking about how you include these in your programs, why it's important, um, because they are associated with medication use in pregnancy, they significantly contribute to child mortality, and they really probably won't be detective unless, detected unless we go out and look for these things. And as medication use in pregnancy rapidly rises, uh, we really need to rat vigilance to be out there to evaluate both birth defects and other adverse birth outcomes.